good tips. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar session on NGC and UTT Natural Gas Education Workshop. I'm hoping everybody is hearing me. See if you just have any problems with audio or with anything, just put a little message in the chat. Um, as the slide says, my name is Corey Hall. I'll be facilitating the presentation this afternoon. I am a measurement, measurement analyst at NGC in the Asset Optimization Division. Um, particularly I deal with the custody transfer of natural gas for Trinidad's largest pipeline, which is the 56 inch cross island pipeline um, in Southern Trinidad. So today for our presentation, just gonna be going over a general overview of the natural gas industry, natural gas properties, how natural gas um, affects Trinidad in the local context as well as in the global context, the natural gas value chain and moving forward. And for anyone who's interested in getting to see this presentation again after we're completed today, it should be posted to the Facebook page tomorrow. So jumping right ahead, we're gonna go through the basics, natural gas 101. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll try to get to get them as they come up. So natural gas, what is it? It's a naturally occurring hydrocarbon consisting primarily of methane and varying amounts of the other higher alkenes, ethane, propane, etc. It's generated by two major processes. We have the thermogenic process, looking at heat, pressure, geology over time to convert organic carbon material to natural gas. So we're pretty much looking at when the dinosaurs went extinct and were buried. Then we have the biogenic form of natural gas generation, which involves methanogens, you know, bacteria, consortia. That usually occurs in swampy areas when we have um, those very moist conditions and the bacteria feeds on decaying matter producing natural gas. When working properly, natural gas has a very bright blue flame. If you see any sort of other color when you're burning natural gas, that usually would indicate the presence of some other component or impurity. Now, natural gas will only ignite in a specific gas to air ratio. So when it looks at the flammability, if the concentration of natural gas is actually below 5%, which is the lower explosive limit, or above 15% when compared to the when compared to oxygen, you won't actually have any combustion. It can be transported over fairly long distances through high pressure pipelines. And this could be on land or from an offshore facility to a land-based facility. And natural gas is actually capable of producing a lot of heat, which is possibly its major use. Looking at about 1 million BTUs, British thermal units of heat of, or energy per 1,000 cubic feet of gas. Now, this is the typical composition of natural gas. The largest component in the natural gas composition would be methane. Now, this is just a typical composition, as I mentioned. However, this composition and the proportions of the elements will actually change depending on what region of the world you may find your natural gas supply. So look at the largest component being methane, followed by ethane, propane, the butanes, and so forth moving normal. Now we have to consider natural gas in terms of the environment. Natural gas became a preferred method for energy as it's considered a relatively clean burning fossil fuel when compared, com compared to diesel, gasoline, and so forth. So being strongly, mainly methane, it is considered a strong greenhouse gas. However, it is a lot cleaner when burnt. Now, natural gas exploration, drilling, and production can have negative effects on the environment, um, disturbing 
habitats, fisheries, depending, especially if you're doing any sort of ex offshore exploration. However, advances in drilling and production technologies have made some very positive impacts on how we protect the environment um, in our operations. There's also been a rise in the strictness of safety regulations and standards that are required for natural gas production, transportation, distribution, and storage. Um, governing agencies such as the EPA in the US, the EMA in Trinidad, have instituted policies that a lot of the energy companies have to abide by when thinking about entering any sort of exploration activity. And all these are implemented with the hope of ensuring that there's as minimal impact on the environment as possible. So historical highlights for Trinidad and Tobago. And now as many of you may have heard, Trinidad has been in the business of energy for a very long time, over 100 years. So going back as far as 1857, we have the first well for oil drilled in Trinidad, only 61 meters deep, not a very deep well. And this was the Merrimack Company in the vicinity of the Pitch Lake. Jumping ahead a few years, we have in 1908, commercial oil production actually beginning in Guapo, that's in South Trinidad. Moving up to the mid 1950s, we see natural gas being used for power generation at the Pinal power station. And that actually does represent a very important milestone in our development. In 1968, Omoko discovers large reserves of natural gas off the East Coast. And you'll actually see on a slide further down in the pre presentation where most of the natural gas for Trinidad actually is found. In 1975, we have one of the most important milestones in Trinidad's development was the start of Point Lisas, the establishment of the NGC, and the formation of the Coordinating Task Force. And the Coordinating Task Force at that time was responsible for ensuring that the infrastructure necessary for us to use this natural resource was in place. In 1976, we have the construction of the 24-inch cross-country pipeline. And then in 1980, we have companies like Escort being established. In 1983, NGC, acting as the custodian of the country's patrimony, we entered into gas supply contracts with, B with Amoco at that time for the Cassia field. In 1991, we started up the Phoenix Park Gas Processing Facility, which is responsible for processing a lot of the gas that goes to Point Lisas. In 1992, NEC and NGC, NEC took over the responsibilities of the Coordinating Task Force. That merger allowed NEC and NGC to more effectively coordinate the, act the activities of business development for the energy sector. And then in a period I think most of us will actually be familiar with, um, we have the first shipment of LNG taking place in the 90s. In 2000, we have the BP takeover of Omoko. In 2005, we had the successful completion of the 56-inch diameter, 76.5-kilometer cross-island pipeline. In 2011, we completed the construction of the Northeastern Offshore Pipeline, which connects Trinidad to the BHP Angostura platform, and then via another pipeline from the platform to Tobago, giving Tobago its first supply of natural gas. In 2013, NGC actually bought out Canoco's shares in Phoenix Park Gas Processes Limited. Now, it should be known that Phoenix Park was actually a partnership between Canoco and NGC, with NGC owning the majority. NGC bought out Canoco's remaining shares, and taking a part of those shares, the TTNGL IPO was launched, which gave the average citizen of Trinidad and Tobago the opportunity to invest 
in a local energy company. This is actually the first energy company to be traded on the stock market. So back to some of the basics of natural gas. So where does oil and gas accumulate in the earth? So we have fossil fuels being found in the sedimentary bases, source rocks subject to heat and pressure. And this is looking at the thermogenic process. The overburden squeezes oil and gas into the porous rocks. And if there's a trap that exists, an accumulation or reservoir is formed. And you can see from the graphic, there are usually three types of accumulations. We have the conventional structural natural gas accumulation with gas and water. Then we have gas being associated with oil. And then to the lower part of the diagram, we see the accumulation of gas in porous rock. And this is indicative of shale gas, which is a major source of natural gas for the United States. So when thinking about getting into this whole business of natural gas and even oil exploration, there are certain ingredients that have to be in place for any sort of investment to be economically successful. Natural gas and hydrocarbon exploration on the whole is extremely expensive. You can have a platform ranging in cost from 100 million US dollars all the way up to 450 million US dollars, depending on the location where it's going to be operating. So a lot of energy sector companies, especially exploration companies, have to ensure that their the economic conditions are right for them to engage in exploration. So they have to be somewhat certain that there is a hydrocarbon rich basin for them to tap into. The technology must be available for them to access the basin. And finally, the price for oil or gas must be favorable to the point that they know that they'll be able to recover the initial expenditure from the exploration fees of the process. So basically the definition of a resource play is a vast accumulation of hydrocarbons known to exist over a large area. And it exhibits lower geologic or commercial risk. Looking at repeatable distribution and recoveries pool well. So basically what an exploration company would do when a hydrocarbon play is formed, a resource play is found, they would drill a couple wells hoping that you get repeated pressure, volume from each well. It gives them a sense of security that once they go into actual production, that the supply will be constant, that the pressure would be good, and they will actually be able to recover, based on the commodity price, the investment that they've made in exploration. So just to tie everything together, you're seeing the exploration model we have land, we have the geology, the geophysics to back up the location for drilling, and then of course, the actual exploration itself. So as I mentioned before, you know, the technology has made it um, a little bit easier for us to one, limit our impact on envir the environment, and two, access reserves that have been traditionally difficult to get to due to whatever rock formation may be present. So usually drilling is straight down. You try to locate your platform over where you believe the reservoir accumulation is and you drill straight down. However, in recent years, horizontal directional drilling has developed as a technology that a lot of companies have adopted to help improve their ability to access reserves. And This is also very good, as I said, for helping to 
mitigate some of the effects on the environment. In the case of the Northeastern, oh, okay, is the audio back up just to confirm? Okay, great. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, as I was saying, yeah, horizontal directional drilling helps us to do things a little bit safer with less impact on the environment. So in the case of the North, Northeastern offshore pipeline, to get the pipeline to the Cove estate in Tobago, there is a major environmental community that surrounds Tobago. And I'm sure everybody could probably figure out what I'm talking about. I'm speaking to the coral reefs which Tobago is very proud of. We didn't want to disturb the coral reefs as they are often breeding grounds for a lot of indigenous fish, you know, fish and so forth. So what horizontal directional drilling was able to do for the NGC, we were actually to drill under the coral bed and bring the pipe up on land at Cove without any sort of major detriment to the coral reef. And I believe this is probably one of the major reasons why this approach to drilling was adopted by the NGC in its, in its development of the natural gas distribution network. So how do we get hydrocarbons to the surface? Now, I'm sure if you have any engineers listening right now, probably have the answer to this already, but for everyone else, basically perforate the casing as it is in the well bore. Sand and water is pumped downhole to create fractures in the reservoir. The fractures are kept open by sand, and this actually allows the gas to flow freely on its natural pressure into the well and up to the surface. Now, as the life of a reservoir goes, the pressure will actually deplete over time. So there are different injection methods that companies would use to ensure that the reservoir maintains pressure, maintains energy, and try to recover as much gas or oil as possible during the lifetime of the reservoir. So the world has been slowly but surely moving towards natural gas and away from oil. So as reported by the Oil and Gas Journal, the proved natural gas reserves have grown by about 40% over the past 20 years. Now, you're going to see terms such as proved, possible, probable. This, this actually um, describes the reserves that are currently known to exploration and production companies. So proven reserves are reserves that have been tested by companies. Yes, gas is present. We have an estimate of how much gas is there. We have possible probable, which are reserves which we're not quite sure exactly what the volume is like, how large the reserve is, but there has been some indication of gas. And that's how a lot of company, that's how a lot of countries actually develop interest in exploration by upstream companies by stating how many probable and possible reserves that they have available, which may give companies the added incentive to engage in exploration and investment. So for the non-OECD regions and OECD stands for Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. The reserves have actually grown by about 43%, um, 1,912 TCF since 1996, and TCF stands for trillion cubic feet. Whereas in the OECD region, it's only grown by about 21%. Looking across the globe, this graphic actually gives you a very interesting view of how the reserves actually spread across the world. Now, if you look to where Trinidad is, we actually see right to the south of us that our closest neighbor, which is Venezuela, actually does have some of the largest oil and gas reserves in this hemisphere, which is very interesting to us as we're always looking for people to partner with 
as it pertains to expanding our natural gas industry. To the north, we have Canada. When we head over to the Middle East, we have Saudi Arabia, who is in the news a lot these days as the major supplier of OPEC and a major influencer on the oil price. Iraq, Iran, Russia, the Emirates, all these countries are the major players in the oil and gas sector. And these are the countries where most of the largest reserves have been found. In Trinidad and Tobago's context, our energy production is about 1.813 quadrillion BTU in 2013. Consumption, only 0.842 quadrillion. Proved reserves as of 2015, 20 trillion cubic feet. Crude oil reserves, 0.7 billion barrels. Total petroleum and other liquids, 109.7 thousand barrels per day. And that's production. This is actually a drop in the pocket when compared to some of these larger countries. As you can see, based on the world ranking, looking at 40th, 40th in production, 64th in consumption. When compared to a country like Venezuela, who has reserves probably 10, 15, 20 times larger than ours, you can see in the scale of things, Trinidad's impact on the global energy market is pretty small when looking based on reserves. But as we can see, Further down, we have had impacts in other ways. This is just a quick overview of the consumption or consumption growth by region. We are seeing in the OECD countries, the developed countries, consumption remains pretty, pretty level and will continue to be sustained until 2035. But you've seen countries like China and other Asian countries major increases in the consumption and the demand for energy. What you should take away from this entire presentation is that energy is the driver of development. Trinidad was actually able to get to where it is now due to the fact that we had access to energy. So countries like China and India who have massive populations who are trying to establish themselves as world economic powerhouses, they need energy to drive development. So their consumption and desire for energy is going to grow dramatically between now and 2035. So pricing. At the end of the day, it, it sort of boils down to price. What affects the price of natural gas? What, what affects the price of oil? It's at its core, a supply-demand dynamic. If the demand is high, the price is high. If the demand is low, the price is low. And the demand is usually affected by the availability of supply. Severe weather can disrupt production. Very often, bad weather may cause exploration companies to halt operations at their offshore facilities for the purpose of maintaining the safety of their staff and by also to by also by suspending operations, they hope to limit any sort of environmental risk that may be present. As I mentioned before, growth, economic growth and development can affect natural gas demand and prices. Winter weather strongly introduce influences residential and commercial demand. As we see in the United States during the winter, the demand for energy goes up and as such, the prices for energy is go, goes up as well. In the summer, hot weather as well could lead to an increase in demand for natural gas. Why? Because everybody nowadays wants to use an air conditioning unit. So definitely in the United States where a lot of homes are essentially cooled, the demand for energy is much greater during the summer. So we see a spike in the price of natural gas and oil and diesel and other associated um, products. Storage of natural gas also does play a key role in meeting peak demand. Com countries like the United States, they try to use expired reserves to store gas so that in the case of a shortage, there's actually gas available or oil available to meet the demand of the citizens until the shortage 
corrects itself. And then we have competition with other fuels that can influence natural gas prices. So as we expect global GDP to double between now and 2035, we can expect, as indicated previously, a rise in the demand for energy and in terms of clean energy or cleaner energy, a rise in the demand for natural gas. So coming back now to Trinidad and Tobago, we've gone to the global context, see how the world looks at energy. Let's see how it works for Trinidad and Tobago. So in 2014, Trinidad and Tobago was the world's sixth largest LNG exporter. And LNG stands for liquefied natural gas. We were the largest LNG exporter to the United States, accounting for about 71% of LNG imports in 2014, and this was mainly to the northeastern United States. Total primary energy consumption in Trinidad and Tobago was about 850 trillion BTU in 2014. And as I mentioned, looking at about 11.5, 12, 12 trillion cubic feet of crude reserves at the beginning of 2016. The largest natural gas processing facility in the Western Hemisphere is Phoenix Park Gas Processors Limited. And what Phoenix Park does, the company actually takes gas in its raw form, processes it, and supplies methane, mainly methane, to the Point Lisas industrial estate. A lot of the plants in Point Lisas prefer to have a much cleaner supply of natural gas as it is the feedstock for a lot of the products that they actually make. The other components in the gas are refined and exported, which allows Phoenix Park to actually make money from what the Point Lisas consumers would consider nuisance elements in the gas. And this is the map I alluded to earlier. This is the energy map. And I've isolated Trinidad and Tobago for the purpose of giving you an idea of where our oil and natural gas is located. So those patches of green that we see in the Southwest and along the Southern part of the island, those are our oil fields. To the East in the offshore region, all those red areas are our gas fields. NGC has been very fortunate because we actually do have some investments in the upstream. Even though we are mainly a transporter and distributor of gas, we have expanded our business to invest in some of the upstream operations. So up to the Northeast, we have our investment in Block 2C and 3A, and that is operated by BHP. Then we have the TSP block down to the Southeast, which is operated by Repsol and then the SECC block, which is operated by EOG. So Trinidad and Tobago's natural gas production, and we're looking at from 2011 to 2015. As we can see from 2011 to 2013, production was really high. And then a major drop off in 2014 and 2015. This represents a very concerning situation for Trinidad and Tobago as we still strive to develop and expand our economic capability as a country. Natural gas production is necessary for continued growth and development. And what's currently happening is that our reserve to production ratio is dwindling. And what that means is that the amount of reserves that we have, the production that's coming out, because it's declining, we are having the issues of gas supply, um, curtailments to the point of industrial estate. And you would see in the newspapers, a lot of the um, consumers talking about gas supply shortfall. And a major reason for this would be a bit of a slowdown in exploration at the upstream, which a lot of companies are actually trying to
Let's just come back and click on it. Alright, okay. Yeah, let me just have one single three corner. Yeah. Okay, let's check it. Is it back up? Okay, great. Yeah, so this is how the gas is utilized in Trinidad and Tobago. So we see the major portion, that purple area, represents LNG. Okay, that, as I mentioned, major export of the country. We have the four trains at point fourteen supplying gas well around the world at this point in time. Then we have the power generation sector in blue. In that red area, we have ammonia manufacturer, green methanol, and the other areas taken up a much smaller proportion. Some of the ammonia companies that we have in Trinidad and Tobago, we have Yara, formerly Hydroagri, we have Trinidad Nitrogen, PCS Nitrogen, Point Lisas Nitrogen, Caribbean Nitrogen Company, MHTL AUM. And in terms of ammonia production, looking at about 5.1 million tons of ammonia being produced in 2011, there was a significant drop in 2013, and it's been slowly creeping up back in 2015 to around 4.9 million tons being produced. Ammonia prices have been fluctuating greatly since 2011. And as we can see that post January 2015, prices are a lot lower than when they were in let's say 2013, which would give credence to what has been um, published in newspapers about lower prices, lower commodity prices, resulting in less revenue for the country. Jumping to methanol now, we have methanol holdings, which operates the CMC, TTMC, TTMC2, CMC2 and M5000 plants. We have the Methanex Corporation, which deals with Titan Methanol and Atlas Methanol. Methanol production at a high in 2011, dropping significantly in 2012, tried to catch itself in 2013, but eventually dropped back down in 2014 and has stayed somewhat constant since then. In terms of pricing, we see a pattern that's somewhat different from what we see for ammonia, with methanol being somewhat constant with a bit of a peak in 2014, but a steady decline up to 2015. And that, that, that decline has actually been somewhat continuing well into 2016. So we are seeing a picture where the major exports and commodities that bring revenue to Trinidad and Tobago, we are seeing that one, production is a lot lower, and two, prices are also a lot lower. So revenues, the revenues that are required to help run the country, are a lot lower than what they used to be. For power generation, so TNTEC, and Wilshire and Tobago has been using natural gas for power generation since 1963. TNTEC, who is responsible for the service, segmented their operations, retaining transmission and distribution, and outsourcing the power generation aspect of the business. They partnered with some independent power producers. So we have PowerGen, Trinity, and Trinidad Generation Limited, TGU to build power plants to supply the country. So PowerGen has plants at Pinal, Point Lisas. The Port of Spain plant was decommissioned. And the Cove Industrial State, which is responsible for about 1,408 megawatts of power combined. The Trinity Power Plant in Point Lisas, which is just one plant, 225 megawatts. And Trinidad Generation Unlimited, which is actually the largest single plant on the island, which produces 720 megawatts of power. Well, capable of producing up to 720 megawatts of power. And we have our light industrial consumers. Now, light industrial consumers are the very small operations that don't require 
very large volumes of gas. And as you can see from the list, it ranges from companies like Air Liquide to Bermudez. Yes, the biscuit company does use natural gas to Kiss, to Movie Town, to Hilton, Trinidad, and Conference Center. One Word Workplace is actually a very unique location as they use natural gas for their central air conditioning system. And this is just a graphical representation of the consumption by the LIC consumers. So the services sector, about 25%, manufacturing and food, 19%, Manufacturing for construction, 12%. Chemicals, non-metallics, 20%. Up to the top, we see a 10% for CNG. And I'm sure as many of many people may have seen from the ads on the radio and TV, CNG is actually gaining in popularity within the country. The major export, LNG. We have the Atlantic company, which operates the trains in Point Fortin. We have Atlantic Train One, which is a partnership between BP Barbados, BG Atlantic One Holdings, Shell, Somersoka LNG, which is actually a Chinese company, and MGC. For trains two and three, we have BP, BG, and Shell being the major shareholders. And then Atlantic Train Four, which is the largest train, the parties are BP, BG, Shell, and NGC. So the process of creating LNG, it's simple when you think about it, but it's a very involved process. So to turn natural gas to LNG, we're looking at reducing the temperature to minus 161 degrees Celsius. At this point in time, the gas changes from vapor to a liquid, hence reducing the volume significantly and allowing for easier transportation. So whereas pipelines will allow you to take high pressure gas from offshore to land, the production of LNG allows you to, once the gas is maintained at that cold temperature, take it from country to country. So allowing Atlantic to ship from Trinidad to let's say Japan. I'm not, I don't think at any point in time anybody ever considered building a pipeline to Japan because it would just be too expensive. So LNG presents a very good option. So the process, as you can see from the diagram, we have the feed gas coming into the plant. We have some initial separation and the gas is metered. You have to know how much gas is actually going into the plant. The process of acid gas removal, dehydration, Mercury, mercury removal, because we don't want any contaminants in the gas stream. Liquefaction and refrigeration. Some of the gas is sent back to the fuel system. The majority of the LNG is sent for storage. And then we also have NGL recovery. NGL will actually be all those components below ethene for the most part. These are actually sent back up to Point Lisa to the Phoenix Park plant, which processes and exports them. And ever so often, a tanker would pull up to the jetties at Atlantic, fill up and take the LNG to destinations unknown around the world. The LNG value chain, and this value chain is what basically determines how we earn money from natural gas. So we have the production phase which is actually getting the gas out of the ground. We have a cost associated with the transmission via pipeline, the cost associated with gas processing and liquefaction, cost associated with shipping and trading. When the LNG gets to its destination, it has to be reconverted into a gaseous form and then distributed to the customers. So there's a value associated with each step in this process of getting the gas from the ground to the customer. And this affects pricing, but it also affects the value that is earned from producing the gas. So these are just a, this is just an idea of the prices for LNG around the world. And this is just in May, 2016. We have Coal Point in the US, $1.78. We 
go down to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, $4.74, all the way to Japan at $4.55. Now, a few years ago, this wasn't the picture. In Coal Point, the price was actually closer to $5. In Rio, closer to $10. Japan, closer to $15. So we've seen a major drop in the price of LNG across the globe which once again results in lower revenues for Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm hoping I'm painting an accurate picture of the scenario that's currently facing us as a country. So going forward, what do we need to do to ensure that this sector remains active, it remains viable, that it continues to be a driver of growth for Trinidad and Tobago? So on the upstream, we have to ensure that acreage is offered at regular intervals to ensure reserve replacement. And what this simply means is that the offshore area of Trinidad and Tobago has been divided into blocks that companies can bid on. The geological information for the block is provided and companies can actually look at it and assess it and analyze it and determine if the geology would indicate that there's a viable resource play available for them to explore. They will then get the option to bid on the block and once successful, they then have a requirement to actually do work to determine if the block can produce or if they don't, they have to give it up after a certain period of time. We also need to explore cross-border partnerships. As I mentioned, Venezuela is very close by, large reserves. It's a partnership that we could possibly consider getting into. However, due to the current economic climate in Venezuela, I'm not quite sure how we will progress with this, but I know discussions are always taking place. In the downstream, we have to look at the development of new projects and expansion of the infrastructure to support the industry's growth. Now, I, would, I know some people are probably asking, well, if the gas isn't there, why would we want to expand infrastructure? Companies would always want to know that there is somewhere for the gas to go. There's no point in going to explore and find gas if there's nowhere to send it. So if there are companies who are actually interested in putting down operations in Trinidad and Tobago and are looking for a gas supply, this now adds added incentive to exploration companies to engage in exploration and go through the process of getting gas to market. And then finally, which I believe applies to you the most, would be the review and improvement of mechanisms to ensure increasing local value is added. We're looking at the development of our people, development of our undergrads, our postgrads, ensuring that we are well equipped to be able to, one, meet the demands of the current energy climate, and two, assist other countries in the development of their industry. You would have heard of NGC looking at countries like Nigeria and Ghana for investment. That is because a lot of these countries look to Trinidad as a roadmap to development. They're often quite amazed at the way such a small island was actually able to develop an industry to this point. And they're very keen to learn and have the talent that exists within Trinidad and Tobago to support them in their development objectives. So by ensuring that our people have the skills necessary, we can help facilitate this international growth for the sector. In terms of policy, some legislative reform does have to take place. We have to increase exploration and production, looking at deep water, heavy oil tar sands. We have to look at increasing oil production using enhanced oil recovery methods and developing heavy oil use, using lease operators and farm outs. Lease operators and farm outs are basically smaller operators who are able The 
anybody here? You know? Okay, great. Thanks, Kimber. Appreciate it. Yes. Um, in gas, we have to look at aggressive exploration to, prove, to improve our reserve to production ratio. We're looking at market growth through value added downstream activities, diversification into other areas. And this diversification isn't the diversification that you hear in the, the newspapers as in terms of tourism and so forth. Diversi diversification into other areas looks at how do we further gain value from our natural gas. So right now we have the gas being produced, sent for methanol, sent for ammonia, sent for LNG. And at that point, we stop earning value from the natural gas. Whereas there are so many other processes, processes that would take these products and further refine them into new products, which we can also gain value from. So we have a new facility being proposed for the Union Industrial Estate, which is the Caribbean Gas Chemical Methanol Plant, um, commonly referred to as the Mitsubishi plant. A part of that plant would be the production of a product called DME, which is a byproduct of methanol, which can be exported, which can be used to earn revenues. So diversification is looking at taking what we currently produce and finding additional ways to have it make money for us. We have to look at operating externally, operating outside of Trinidad and Tobago, looking at international investment, and also looking at reforming of the gas market merchant model. How do we price gas? Where did, what are the best markets for us, for our products, so that we earn the most revenue available? Energy policy drives everything. So the policies have to be in line with the goals of the country. So in terms of power generation, we have to look at implementing policies that promote efficiency, reliability, and accessibility. Legislative reform to support renewable energy. You're probably wondering why renewable energy? What does that have to do with natural gas? When a household decides that they're gonna install a solar panel on their rooftop, and start producing their own energy, they sort of offset their supply from TN Tech. Once TN Tech has enough customers just generating their own energy, demand falls, therefore TN Tech needs less gas. That means gas can be diverted to another area where it can once again gain value. Um, alternative energy, legislative incentives to promote the use, both on the demand and supply side, um, expansion of CNG as a alternative vehicle fuel, fiscal incentives for renewable energy, continuous reform of the natural gas legislation, the production sharing contract framework mm -hmm. to promote continuous exploration and development, a uh, local content policy framework has to be looked at, and the legislation to support the service sector growth and the leveraging of export potential. And this is once again speaking to our ability to market ourselves internationally as not only a source for financial investments, but a source of expertise, expert labor services that support energy sector development. So CNG sort of left this for last. Now CNG is readily available to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. There are plans to further expand the CNG network to make it easier for the everyday citizen to access CNG and make it a part of their fuel consumption type matrix. So instead of just using gasoline, thinking about adopting CNG. Now CNG is not meant to replace your gasoline, um, supplying, but what it does do is extend your range. So instead of having to fill up your tank with gasoline two to three times a week, CNG would help to extend your range and will allow you to reduce the amount of time that you have to fill up to maybe once a week. 
So we look at the retail price of CNG being a dollar per liter. So when you switch to CNG, you're looking at about 82% of your fuel bill in savings if you're a premium gasoline user, 68% if super, 42% if diesel. And CNG is a lot cleaner. So if you're environmentally conscious, CNG is an excellent option as it doesn't contain sulfur and it's sort of particulate matter. And that actually helps your engine as CNG burns cleaner than other liquid fuels. And your engine tensors, you know, run quieter, a lot smoother. And this translates into lower vehicle maintenance costs. For Trinidad and Tobago, being more, more environmentally friendly, you know, CNG produces 25% less carbon dioxide than gasoline and 35% less than diesel. It has a higher octane rating than gasoline ever can. And CNG engines reduce noise pollution by running, as I said, smoother and quieter than gasoline or diesel engines. Now, some auto dealers have started bringing in CNG vehicles. So we see Honda marketing the Honda City. Now, if this Honda City is a little bit too small for you and you're looking to upgrade, Mercedes also has a CNG E200. So if you're interested, you could go check Sterling and they will probably give you a test drive. NGC actually was lucky enough to acquire one of these E200 vehicles just to show that CNG does not limit your options in terms of vehicle purchase. And very often we see a lot of companies now exploring CNG options for their vehicle lines. So we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot more CNG options in terms of transport in the near future. If you're just thinking about converting your current vehicle, we have companies like Massey ACL and Arima, who is approved, who is an approved converter for CNG and ensure that you will have a nice, safe installation in your vehicle. We have seen in the past where people have tried to use a regular gas tank, as in cooking gas tank, for CNG, and that has had some very undesirable results. So if you're looking at CNG, go to an approved dealer and converter and think about the effect that you're going to be having on the environment by making a conversion. So in conclusion, we're looking into the future of downstream gas markets, gas production from non-traditional sources and how they have the potential to transform this global landscape. Um, emerging shale gas production in the United States has brought the prices for gas down. And it's encouraging actually the revival of some idled ammonia and methanol plants and the construction of new facilities that will commence operation over the next few years. So that does mean increased competition for our local producers. Now, Trinidad and Tobago, the energy sector accounts for about 45% of our GDP. I mean, we close to 72% of our revenues. So the energy sector isn't going to go anywhere and we don't need it to go anywhere in the near future. So it will take the brilliance, the intelligence of the citizens, all you bright undergrads, engineers, HR professionals, accountants, to come together to ensure that the industry remains strong and continues to survive. So we have to remember that gas is one of the fastest growing fossil fuels and it's supported by strong supply growth. And to remain competitive, we need to do whatever is required of us to ensure that we continue to be a partner in this global energy market. And once again, just making the environmental plug, carbon emissions have actually halved in, in the past 20 years. Why? Because we are making that switch from those traditional fuels to clean up burning natural gas. So uh, this is just to give you an idea of just how important the sector is, how important this industry is, and why you should possibly consider making a career in the energy sector. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar presentation. I will take questions at this point in time, so please type them in the chat. 
and I'll try to give you the best answer that I possibly can. Everyone, feel free to type away. All right, so we have a, I have a pop quiz for y'all. Let me see who's gonna answer. Oh, we have a. Okay, everybody was listening. Yes, methane, that is the major component. Lisa, as for your question, is growth to be seen, is growth expected to be seen anytime soon with respect to gas exploration? Now, that's a really good question. Um, Exploration is actually a very long process. So you may find gas today and actually not be able to get it to market until maybe three to four years down the road because you have to put the infrastructure in place to ensure that you can actually safely get the supply to market. So our growth right now will actually be supported by companies looking at ways to improve supply from the current current reservoirs. So you would have seen in newspapers a project called Truck being sanctioned. What this stands for is Trinidad Regional Osho Compression Project. And what they will do is decrease the pressure at the wellhead to ensure that more gas flows from the wells. Bring it into the network where NGC and Atlantic will then compress the gas back up to a workable operating pressure to supply the estate as well as supply Atlantic. So what will happen is that in this period, we will just simply try to offset with improved operation until newer reservoirs come on stream. And Tony, to answer your question as it pertains to the age of our assets and the risk, a lot of companies have invested a lot in asset integrity management. So they have done what they have what they can to ensure that the assets still remain viable, even, so, even though some of them are actually approaching their design life. So a lot of the offshore platforms have been operating for a very long time, but companies are constantly ensuring that um, the measures are, are taken to rehabilitate, repair as often as possible to ensure that the facilities can continue operation. So risk minimization is actually a major part of how we conduct our, our business. Not a problem, Tony. All right, another pop quiz. Let me see, make it interesting. Who can give me a very quick example in the local scenario of how horizontal directional drilling made an impact on the energy sector? Nothing long, really quick.
that step forward to engage in exploration activities in the deep water. And we also have BP, who's actually looking at reevaluating a lot of their acreage to with the newer technology to see if they can identify newer reserves closer to the shore that they'll be able to tap into. So there's a lot of work going on right now to help jumpstart this whole exploration process all over again. All right, take it. That's Kimber, you hit, it, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Lisa, just to, re uh, just to repeat, yes, um, companies are, are, already, are always planning, looking at options and waiting for the right conditions to engage, um, engage in exploration activities. So BHP did a lot of work, did a lot of analysis and research, and just recently started some work in me in the deep water. And BP is currently looking at reevaluating some of the acreage that it currently has with newer technologies to help pinpoint reserves that haven't been tapped as yet. And just to answer to Jay's question about employment. Now, right now, due to the environment, the aren't, jobs aren't readily available. However, with the projected growth and the direction that the country is taking, is you hope that we're actually going to be able to, one, start finding places for a lot of our undergrads and postgrads ah. who have been studying and developing their skills and also looking at options for exporting a lot of our talent. You, you, you hear the stories about Trinidadians going to some of these other countries and actually performing really well in helping those countries set up, whether it be plants or pipelines. So we're, the, the scope has changed dramatically from just being staffing local operations, but also how we look at international operations as well. And to Jay, so you have a nautical science maritime operations background. And it's very, yes, it would be very, very difficult at the moment. The downturn in prices and in, for the energy sector has had a very significant impact on employment opportunities within the industry. We actually have a lot of very skilled people on the market right now looking for jobs who have the experience which a recent undergrad may not, a recent graduate may not have. Um, what I would suggest at this point in time, and this is advice I give to everybody, this is actually a good time to continue learning. Now, I know you just completed how many years at UE or whatever institution that you, um, you attended, but this is not the time to stop. What I would advise is that, okay, so you have your background in nautical science and maritime operations. Do you have any sort of experience in business? And I actually, I actually recommend to a lot of engineers and people with that very scientific type background to look at increasing your knowledge of business practices, finance, accounting. Why? Because a lot of companies are looking for very versatile employees at this stage in the game. You actually have to be able to fit in within any part of the structure. So yes, you could end up working in a department that deals with nautical science and maritime operations, or you can be assigned to the department that looks at developing opportunities, business opportunities within the area of maritime operations. So take this time, to further your knowledge of the industry, the knowledge of business practices, and how they can connect with your core competency. So that when the energy sector rebounds, as it usually does, because this entire energy sector is a cyclical thing. This has happened in the past, and it will probably happen again in the future. There's the, the, the highs and lows within the sector. So just keep at it. Just keep learning. Keep developing yourself. 
some of the accounting and finance programs that you can think of. You can look at maybe ACCA. Now, you don't actually have to go and do the full ACCA program, but ACC, ACCA does have a couple one-year programs, whether it be in finance and so forth, that actually allow you to get a very good grasp of what it means to do business. For example, my degree is actually in pure and applied mathematics. However, to keep pace with what's going on in the sector, I am currently trying to wrap up an MBA. So even for those of us who are actually in the sector, we ha- you always have to keep refining your skills and expanding your skills. So don't look at the lack of jobs now as, a, as an obstacle, but look at it as an opportunity to make yourself just that much more attractive when things are the rebound. Well, I'm 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 hoping the advice is I'm I'm hoping the advice is good. Um, it's a really I know it's a really difficult time. You know, you've just you've put in a few you put in a few years well learning, and to see the market now as it is, it can be a little depressing. But don't let it don't let it stop you from developing yourself and growing. Someone told me a very long time ago, all a BA does it all it means is begin again. And that's what a lot of us have had to do to ensure that we remain competitive. And that's the advice I will give to you. Any other questions from anybody else? Okay, so do I think that asset integrity maintenance has an impact on the shortfall in gas that we are seeing? I think that asset integrity maintenance has always been responsible for outages, but a lot of these things are planned. So a lot of companies have scheduled maintenance works that will ensure that their operations continue. Now, in the case of BP, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill was an eye-opener they realized that they had to pay a lot of attention, a lot more attention to how they operate, you know, within the various regions that they do. So they went on a global asset integrity drive to ensure that their facilities are operating in a safe and efficient manner. So yes, the scheduling of a lot of asset integrity work does have an effect on gas supply. But once again, those are that's only for a time. Eventually, a lot of these works would be at a stage where reliability has been ensured and full operation can resume. But it has a lot to do with how you plan these works. Okay, Chanel, that's a really good question. HSC. The energy sector is driven by safety. We have, every company has its own creed motto when it comes to safety. Atlantic, um, if a job is not safe, we will not do it. And you see different variations across the board. Right? So for someone who did studies in the environmental field, safety would also be an added bonus because in most cases, a lot of companies have merged the health, safety, and environment function. So if you're actually able to present a company with a background in all of those areas, you are automatically going to be seen as a more viable candidate. So we have, for example, PCS. They have their safety, health, an environment department, NGC has an HSC department. And HSC, because of its its importance, there will always be a need for professionals. So I would suggest, yeah, look look at 
developing this health and safety side of your skill set, and it should definitely put you in a lot better position. Not a problem. Well, folks, um, that's actually all the time I have for today for this session. I really thank everybody for the questions and for the participation. I really hope that the presentation was informative and that you did get a lot of it from it. So I'm not sure if the registration is full for the other sessions, but if the, oh, it is, oh, that's unfortunate. Well, yes, the next presentation should be on Thursday. Yeah. And everything will be made available online on Facebook, at least this presentation tomorrow, and I believe for the other presentations the following day. So you could always go back and um, take a look at the presentations. My email is actually on the first slide, so if you have any questions, feel free to email me and I'll try to get back to you in as timely a uh, time frame as possible. So once again, thank everyone for your participation today and continue continue developing yourselves, continue focusing, and hopefully I'll be working with you sometime in the near future. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.